I stand here, does that work? I feel like I disappear if I stand over here. That's not going to be fun for anyone. Cool. Uh, good morning. Welcome. Thank you so much to the organizers um, for having me. Thank you um, for coming and showing up so early. Um, I wanted to talk a bit about um, information security, the community, um, my sort of path to where I am today, um, journalism, and the work that I do at the New York Times. How's this? I think it turned off my mic. <clears throat> Does this work? OK, it still works. Cool. <laughs> so uh, quick intro. I'm originally from Oslo, Norway. I moved out about nine years ago. So I first lived in London for a couple of years, um, Washington, DC, and now I'm in New York City. Um, I hacked a sniper rifle in 2015, which was a, um, it was a bit of a different project in the sense that um, it had nothing to do with um, anonymity or privacy or um, activism, the type of work that I had done up until that point in time. It was a project that came out of um, really wanting, wanting to show that I could do something that was so different from what I had been known to do up until that point. Um, so I've, growing up in Norway, I was always super fascinated with the US. Um, my textbooks when learning English had all of those fancy stock photos of like New York City and the Empire State Building and Central Park. And so I had this like very romanticized view of a lot of things in the US. And so my husband said there's a gun show um, out by Dulles Airport, we should totally go. Um, and um, at that point, we found uh, Tracking Point, uh, the maker of this rifle, um, and they had this uh, brochure that said that it had uh, software updates and USB ports and mobile apps, and it sounded really fancy. So in the car on the way home, I said, hey, honey, we should, we should buy two of them and hack them and uh, give a talk at Black Hat the next year. And he said, sure, we can do that. So that was how that happened. Um, I am also a certified sake advisor as of last year. Um, I think it's a sort of a bad joke in there that I needed a hobby, so I took up drinking. Um, but really, it, um, it's sort of something that came out of just needing to do something that wasn't work. I've always very strongly identified with um, the work that I do. And I see the work that I do as who I am. There's no sort of like work life. Uh, and personal life, it just sort of blends. And so for me, um, tasting sake, talking about the drink, sharing that experience with someone else has sort of become, um, I guess, my not work, not infosec um, hobby, if you will. Um, so I worked on tour and Sucker Drop, now at the Times. And um, I did ask Twitter for questions for this presentation. I wanted to mix it up a bit. I wanted to hear what you wanted to hear from me. And so I took a couple of questions that I've um, included as well. So I was going for like, ask me almost anything. And I got the brackets wrong. But um, anyways, that's sort of how it started out. And one of the sort of more interesting questions that I got was this one, which asked about the roadblocks in my way when I started and how they changed between then and where I am now. So um, I wanted to just talk a bit more about um, sort of where I started, the different um, sort of projects or aspects of um, InfoSec that I've worked on since then, and then see if I can um, eloquently share some thoughts on the roadblock. So, um, so I got a bachelor's in Norway, um, and I was originally going for a master's. So back then, um, it seemed like everyone in Norway had a master's. Um, education is almost free, which means that pretty much everyone goes for a degree of some sort. Um, and for me, that was just it. There was no other option. I was going to go for the five-year master's in computer science, and then I was going to go into consulting. That was sort of the path that I had envisioned for myself. Um, but through 
Um, I found that I wasn't a huge fan of math and physics. I didn't do well in those um, co courses. And so I ended up just switching to the bachelor's. I ended up um, working for the Tor project, initially as Google Summer of Code while I was still a student. Um, but then I ended up um, volunteering. After that, um, I got a part-time contract and then later on a full-time contract as well. Um, so we're all sort of on top of that. I ended up doing penetration testing in London for a company. Um, that was right after I graduated, where I just sent this company my resume. And I was like, I am graduating in June. I'm really excited about all of these things. Do you have anything opening? Um, and they took a chance on me. They took a chance on someone who was really passionate about what they do, but didn't already have the experience in the field. Um, so through working with them for about a year and continuing working for Tor, I really got um, exposed to both sort of enterprise work, penetration testing, code audits, um, that type of professional consulting work, as well as working with a nonprofit, um, working for the Tor project, which at that point was, um, I think I was initially doing more research development. But over the four years, ultimately, that I spent with Tor, um, I also ended up doing project uh, management. Um, I built out the support portal. I ended up training a lot of reporters. So really, over like, the course of four years, I got to try many, many different types of roles, which I think has really helped shape um, what I'm doing today. So I worked on Freedom of the Press Foundation and Secure Drop, which was sort of a lot of the same things. So I got to consult for a bunch of media orgs through independent work. Um, in 2016, I joined the New York Times as the Director of Information Security for the newsroom. So back then, the Times had a security team, um, but no one was dedicated to the newsroom. And in some cases, when I came in, um, people didn't know that we had a CISO. They didn't know we had a security team. They didn't know that, that what that team was doing. They, they had no idea why I was there. They didn't know what I was doing in the newsroom. Um, and one of the first things that I did coming into this newsroom, that's 1,500 people, 1,100 reporters, many different desks. So you have like the Metro desk, you have sports, you have national style, cooking. You need, you need to introduce yourself somehow and help them understand what you're there to do and what your mission is. Um, so I just started fishing a lot of people. Um, I, I created monthly fishing assessments for the newsroom that I sent out. And then I, on an internal site, about a week or so after the assessment, would publish like here was the phishing email. Here were the things that you could look for to tell that this was a fish. Um, here's how many people opened the email. Here's how many people clicked the link. And here's how many people entered their usernames and passwords. And then I noted the top five desks, top in the sense of they had the highest number of people that had uh, gone all the way and entered their credentials. Um, and so through this monthly phishing assessment, uh, not only did people get to know me, I then got to sit down with different desks and introduce myself and say, hey, so Styles, you were the top, top one last month. Let's chat. Um, and I also got to the point then where um, I would do the phishing assessment. People would pick up that this was a test. And like the week following, they would like ask me in the hallway or ask me in the elevator, when is the report coming? Um, and so I think, that I, I think that was a really sort of interesting way to just um, get to know people in a newsroom and get to know people in a space where you, you, are, the, you are the odd man out, right? No one has any idea why you're there. Um, and uh, I'm now the senior director, and I have a team of four people. Uh, total, I think we're a team of, I'm going to say 10 or 11. Um, so my team, we had to have a name, so I said defense. Um, we also have education and AppSec and um, incident response. So, but my team really tackles anything, everything security for the company that includes the newsroom and includes the business side as well. Um, so, within the roadblocks, so I was, I was trying to figure out um, sort of through all that really varied work from um, 
wanting to do a master's in Norway to ending up with a bachelor's, working for a nonprofit, doing a lot of consulting, a lot of public speaking, a lot of independent work into where I am today. And I think the best way I can phrase it is really the, the, the only roadblock has been how I view myself and my role. Um, there's been times where I, I got so stuck on the problem that I really couldn't see it any other way, and I, I sort of wasn't able to find a creative solution. Um, I mean, there's certainly been um, the drama in the InfoSec community that seems to be like a constant in some way, shape, or form. There's been, um, there's been jerks. You run into assholes. This is life that happens. Um, and there's sort of those, the, there's been those components that there's been uh, tech skills that I've had to acquire, things that I had to figure out, but really the sort of roadblocks per se have just more been how um, I view myself and how I view those challenges, not so much um, any impact from external factors, if that makes sense. Because um, really some of the challenges that I have today, be it um, finding a way to contribute in a meeting that is full of senior executives where I don't want to interrupt anyone. Um, that is a challenge that I ran into last year that in some ways was a challenge that I had five years ago as well. It just wasn't in the same context. So, um, But I'm, I'm happy to chat more about this later. And if you have any sort of thoughts on other types of roadblocks, I would love to hear about them. So the next tweet um, that I got was what kind of threats we see at the times. Um, so I wanted to talk a bit more about the, the work that we do, the challenges that we've sort of seen in the newsroom. Um, I can talk like high level about threats, but I can't like be too detailed. Um, but I'm sure you can imagine some of the things that we see. So, um, so in the newsroom, you have, like I said, there's like 1,100 reporters. You have a bunch of different desks. You have Metro and investigations. You have the foreign desk. You have um, the national. You have styles. You have cooking. You have obituaries. All of these desks are going to have somewhat different concerns. We also then have like more than 20, more than 25, I think foreign bureaus where uh, a bureau in Berlin is going to have different concerns than a bureau in Beijing, for example. Um, and then you also have the individuals on the different desks have their own concerns as well. You're going to have someone on, um, let's say, on the foreign desk that travels a lot, but not to any sort of high-risk areas. And then you're going to have someone on the foreign desk who travels a lot and travels to Syria and writes about ISIS. Those are two very different th threat models, two different sort of areas of concern. And then add on to that, you have how um, familiar they are with tech. So there are some re reporters that are all about uh, travel laptops, burner phones, Signal, Faraday bags. Like, they got their own system. We haven't had to like do a whole lot of training or add a whole lot onto them. They sort of figured it out themselves. And then you have some that really should have all of these things, but they just haven't had anyone there to support them and train them and show it, show them how that works. So that's sort of the landscape that we're working with and sort of figuring out what's what and who needs what has been um, has been a bit of a process for us. Um, we also have a fun challenge in that when it comes to phishing especially, um, the quick fire response, especially among InfoSec Twitter, is just don't click. If you don't expect that email from that person, if you don't even know the sender, do not open the email, do not click the link. Now for a newsroom who lives on receiving tips from strangers, that advice just doesn't work. So we need to find a way to allow them to just open random emails, click on, on links, um, and do so in a way that does not present a risk. So that's been a fun challenge. Newsroom is also extremely deadline driven and product focused, meaning uh, anything it takes to get the news out, they will do, even if that means 
doing things in a non-secure way. Ultimately, getting the story out, getting the information, getting the results, telling that story is their job. And that is the mission that we support. So we have to play along with that. Um, solutions that we create have to be usable and reliable. Um, years ago, um, back in, I think, 2011, Tor Project got funding from um, I think it was the State Department back then to train reporters, and I ended up working on this project. And one thing that I would do a lot was sort of envision that, let's say that I'm, I'm traveling now to a new country. Um, let's say that I'm going to meet with a source. I'm on assignment. I'm going to work on a particular story. But I also want to do it securely. I don't need my usual laptop. I don't need my usual phone. How can I create a travel setup that will work for me and be usable and reliable? And sort of through exercises like that, I was sort of able to then figure out what works for me and sort of set the bar for what I think will be usable by a reporter. Because um, in some cases, we, we sort of jump to really technical, and they're technically neat. Some of these solutions that I see in this space are like fantastic. Um, Cubes is a super interesting operating system. I love the idea. I love how it functions. It takes a long time to get it set up. There's a lot of configs, a lot of back and forth, and it's a pretty high bar to get started with. I don't know if that's super usable for a reporter unless they're technical or have that support system. So finding that balance has sort of been something that we've been working on um, a lot. And then there's a lot of sort of relationship building, trust building, um, in the newsroom as well, ensuring that when something happens, when they get a tip, when they're about to meet with a source, um, when they're about to travel to North Korea, that they actually come to you to ask for help. Um, so um, actually, just jumping, jumping back for a second, in terms of um, threats, with this super varied landscape and different threat models and individuals at sort of different levels of um, tech skill sets, um, we sort of see everything from just typical adware that's just bundled with software that you really need um, to attempts by nation state actors. We really see everything. Um, there's a lot of phishing, um, which is not Surprising, we had a case, I think that was last week, one of our reporters um, in London traveling to Cairo for a meeting, got detained, had his electronics um, confiscated, was held for, I think, about seven hours, and then sent home. So he was not allowed into the country. So that's sort of another challenge that, that we deal with. We sometimes have reporters go missing. That's another challenge that we have to deal with as well. Um, so it's sort of really all over the place. I think the biggest challenge is um, ensuring that we are in the loop and the reporters are up to something that could require our assistance, and then make sure that we have the playbooks to support them in doing whatever it is that they're going to do. And oftentimes, you're just not going to be in the loop, because breaking news happens at 5 AM, and by 7, we have someone on a plane. And you're not going to be able to get them a loaner laptop within that time frame. So, um, so some of the things that we've done over the past couple of years, um, I mentioned the regular phishing assessments. Um, sometimes they're targeted. Um, I had, um, I've had reporters write the phishing emails um, just to create some added competition and fun that seemed to be like a popular thing. Um, we do security awareness training for all new hires, um, so we get. I think, I think this is still the case, but it definitely was up until end of last year, one full hour with every new hire in the newsroom, specifically for security. Um, we also do tailored training with different desks. So the training that I would give to investigations is a tiny bit different than the training that I would give to obituaries, for example. Um, we do a lot of sort of awareness through newsletters. We send out advisories if we're aware of um, a phishing scam like the uh, Bitcoin ransomware, I have your password, I have your photos, I have um, photos of you, that scam that um, rolled out a while back. We sent out an advisory about that, for example. Just to let people know that this is a thing, we are aware, we are paying attention, 
we are here to help you. Let us know if there's anything that we can do. Uh, we had National Cybersecurity Awareness Month last year uh, and put together a bunch of events for that, um, including lock picking. Um, so we did lock picking both for the business side of the company as well as for the newsroom, which was incredibly po popular and well attended. Um, we really focused like a lot on uh, culture as well as building relationships with external vendors. So one thing that we see often in the newsroom is that uh, as a reporter, there's really no difference um, between personal and professional life for you, which means that there's not a whole lot of difference between personal accounts and professional accounts. If a source wants to talk on a platform, you're going to create an account on that platform and talk to that source. Um, which means that there's sort of a mix. People frequently use their Twitter accounts both to uh, share their stories, but also to communicate with <coughs> sources. Same goes for Facebook, same goes for Instagram and other platforms. Now, the challenge that we run into there is that if a reporter's Instagram is compromised, that is something that they will report to us and we will help them with but it is ultimately a personal account in the eyes of Facebook, which means that having that relationship and ensuring that we can escalate this to Facebook on behalf of the reporter in their personal account becomes really, really important. Um, so we spent a lot of time building that um, structure, figuring out the right context, making sure that we both have a sense of the playbooks so that the right people on both sides can be engaged and we can address the issues that pop up in a timely basis. Um, so some of the challenges in, well, it says in 2019, but it really is since like 2017, um, where the political climate is different, the rhetoric is different, the language is different, um, and reporters, and especially the New York Times, is seen as, um, in some cases, um, an enemy of the people. And while online threats and online harassment isn't new, um, we have seen it escalate. We have seen it be more persistent, and it's just sort of come across as being different in many ways. Um, that's a challenge that we share with a lot of other media orgs as well. Um, we do take steps now to collaborate between information security, legal, corporate communications, physical security, to figure out how we can best support the staff in the newsroom. And also within the newsroom, there are then efforts to ensure that the reporters who are taking on certain stories have the support system that they need to be able to do the research, write the story, publish it, and um, share that with the world while also feeling that they are safe and supported in, in, in doing so. Um, so that's sort of been part of a big initiative that we kicked off about a year ago, um, and that continues to this day. Um, we also then set up sort of different ways to um, report the issues that pop up. And again, whether you're now receiving threats on um, via email, if it's on Twitter, if it's on Facebook, we have those relationships and those protocols in place that allow us to provide the support that the newsroom needs. Um, we also created um, last summer a doxing service where if a reporter sends us an email and in writing gives us permission to dox them, we will spend about an hour and a half finding what we can find about them online and then present them with those findings and help them take steps to either remove or lock down that data. So they have a sense before they publish a contentious story um, what's going to be out there about them. Um, and so that was a service that we launched last summer. We've since turned it into a workshop where we just pe teach people how to dox themselves. Let's see, where do you see the role of journalism going in the, fa in the face of deep fakes and increasingly hard to validate information? And what role do we play to protect and enhance those journalists? That is a fun and tricky one. Um, so in late 2016, we set up the tip line at the New York Times. So on nytimes.com slash tips, you'll find the different ways that you can securely, and in one case, anonymously contact um, the newsroom. And so up until that point, 
Um, it, was, it was sort of easy to submit a tip if you already had a relationship with a reporter or if the reporter was easy to reach if they published their email address or something like that. Um, but there was no good way to submit a tip to the New York Times, the media organization, the institution. So we set this up to, to allow for that to happen. Um, and in doing so, we also built a, both a process and a technical setup that allows um, the team to safely view all the tips that are coming in, sanitize any documents that they receive in terms of anything that's embedded in them, um, and then essentially figure out what's a tip, what's spam, and then pass that on to the various desks in the newsroom. Um, the, the challenge, going back to the question, is how do you vet this data? Uh, in the case of the tips that we received through SecureDrop, you often don't know who's sending that tip. You have no way necessarily to, to you, you can't take it at face value. You have to do some additional digging. Um, and in the newsroom, and at least at the times, there's already a sort of structure in place to ensure that there is proper vetting of the information that you receive before it is published in the paper. Um, so there are um, some policies around um, how many people need to back up a tip, how many sources do you need to be able to confirm the information that you received before you can sort of move forward and trust that that is um, accurate data that you can go out and publish. Um, there's also a policy around use of anonymous sources. So if you want to go and cite an anonymous source in the paper, there, there is a policy and a process in place for getting to that point. So you can't just put out whatever you want. It has to be vetted. It has to be verified on different levels. Um, I think deepfakes makes that a bit more difficult. Um, but I think that there's still a, there is a structure in place to sort of try and tackle the challenge of vetting. And I think that um, moving forward, I think there will be more discussions around the challenges with deepfakes as well. And so the last, the last tweet that I wanted to include, if you were just starting in 2019, how would you get started doing what you do? Um, that's a tricky one in part um, because I, I started in Norway, where it's just a different environment, different culture, different country. Um, and I also know that the InfoSec community has changed in some ways since from back then and until today. So there may be challenges that people are running into now that I'm just not aware of. It could be that the any advice that I give you in the next five minutes uh, will just not apply and I have huge blind spots because there are challenges that I'm just not aware of. Um, but I think like looking back um, sort of all the different things that I've done, I think the most beneficial part of it was working for the Tor Project. I think being part of a nonprofit um, that allowed me to do so much varied work and take on so many different roles um, and travel and see different cultures and meet different people and sort of hear about what they need versus what I think that they need um, has been, I think, one of the most uh, rewarding experiences. Because really the, the experience that I gained at that point in time working with reporters and really trying to figure out how can I provide them with um, a level of digital security and practices that they can um, Im implement themselves that's not going to require support moving forward, that's not going to require this massive system that they don't have access to. Um, I think that mindset and that sort of experience really really helped me um, where I am today. Um, so that is sort of one recommendation. Now I know that nonprofit world doesn't pay a lot. It's not always very fun either. I think you can see the same thing about enterprise. Um, but really for me, finding a way to try many different roles was, was really important. Um, the other piece <clears throat> that I would say is um, figure out what it is that you're passionate about and focus on that. 
find a hobby too, that'd be great, but um, that's not InfoSec. But um, find something that, that you really enjoy and focus on that. There's a lot of drama in InfoSec. There was drama back then, there is drama now. I don't think that we're ever gonna have a drama-free community. Um, but just because there's drama in different corners does not mean that you have to get hung up on that. So focus on what it is that you want to get out of your work, on your life, on your career, and don't get too hung up on what other people are up to. And don't get too hung up on what's not working. That was, that, that was something that I really struggled with for a long time. I was, um, I've always been super passionate about what I do, but it was to some extent passionate to a fault, where I would, I would spend, I didn't have much of sort of like a personal life. I didn't have non-infosec hobbies. Um, it was sort of all infosec all the time. And so when things didn't work or when there was, um, someone did something that I didn't um, think was sort of the right way to do it or um, someone, I expected someone to do something and they didn't, that really frustrated me. And I got really hung up on sort of all, all the things that are not working that I just wasn't able to see what's actually working and what we're doing well and the things that we're achieving and the success that we have. Um, and that applies not just to sort of in a, in a work context, but also how I saw my own success. I think that taking a moment to recognize where you're at and how you got there I think is really important. Um, and I think that is something that I would say in terms of if you were just starting now, what you should do, find, find something you're passionate about and focus on that and ignore, ignore the drama and ignore the people that say that you can't do it. So, and I think that is what I will leave you with. I believe we have some time for questions if anyone's got any, if not, I am around all day, I would love to chat. Thank you. So the question is, when we have people traveling, what do we do to set them up for success? Internationally. Internationally, okay. A um, couple of things. Um, last year, we held, um, first we held two workshops in the newsroom where we included um, someone formerly with the ACLU, we included in-house counsel, and myself. And we talked to the reporters about where, what are the challenges with traveling, with border crossings, and especially at that point uh, with coming back into the States. We talked about uh, what the law says. We talked about uh, what you can and cannot say and what you can and cannot do when you're at the border, what your rights are, what the company will do for you, how do you get a hold of the right person if you're detained. And then we talked about the tech piece of it, what you can do at the border to protect your data uh, or in advance of traveling in, in that case. Um, and the advice that we give is um, loaner laptops. If you can, take a travel phone as well. Ensure that um, you only take with you on that device or on that phone the information that you need access to when you're traveling. So uh, when I went to um, our Moscow bureau a couple of years ago, I had a Chromebook that I had access to the accounts that I needed at that point in time. I had a phone that had signal and the phone numbers that I needed at that point in time and my email, and that was it. Um, I didn't need Facebook, I didn't need Twitter, I didn't need the 5,000 documents that I worked on over the course of my career, right? So really thinking about what it is that you need access to when you're traveling um, is, is the advice that we get. Now, there are some reporters that take this to heart and they have high risk trips like to North Korea where implementing this is something that they can do. They have the time, they have the support, they have the understanding of their uh, editors. Um, but we also recognize that breaking news happens, sometimes you just pick up and you go. Um, so at that point, we suggest 
Travel laptop if you can. If you don't have time, then at the very least ensure that your devices are fully powered off before you cross the border in the case that your devices are seized at that point in time. Um, depending on the country, you can say no to having your devices seized, maybe, possibly. You can allow them to be seized and just accept that that's going to happen. In some cases, you may then be deported. In other cases, you may be forced to enter a username and password. It sort of really depends on the scenario and the country that you're going to. Um, and we try to like just educate staff on the challenges um, and provide them with the laptop and the guidance along the way. But it's certainly not like a it's not like a foolproof system. We haven't like fully figured this out. It's not a super well well machine, but we have a process in place at least. Does that help? Cool. Yes. Since we're sitting here at the Columbus Police Academy, do you also work with um, the New York Times physical security team to help kind of cross over the technology to the physical protection? So the question is, do we work with the physical security team at the Times? Yes, we do. Um, so one thing that we started doing at the beginning of 2018 was have biweekly meetings with those stakeholders to talk about the challenges that pop up. Because we see that um, in terms of threats and harassment um, against the New York Times and against the newsroom especially, it's not purely physical, it's not purely digital. At some point, those two worlds merge and it's really important that we understand what's what and have that playbook um, in, in place. So that is something that we are doing, yeah. Any other questions? Challenges I faced in dealing with the firewall in China. Um, so I think that back back when I worked for the Tor project, um, understanding the firewall in China became really important. Um, so back then, at the Tor project, we spent a lot of time um, both researching externally. We gathered data from people in the country to really understand how it's blocking, when it blocks, when it ramps up the blocking, what that looks like, and get a sense of ways in which that you can uh, still connect to the internet from within China, using Tor in that case. Um, and I think that taking that experience to where I'm at now, um, we see that Tor works, but you have to jump through so many hoops that it's not always feasible to tell a non-technical user to go ahead and set all that up. Um, we find ways to, per, to set them up with a corporate VPN in ways in which that isn't blocked or isn't always blocked in China. And we also do just rely on the people that we already have there in the bureaus in Beijing and Shanghai to provide the VPNs that actually work at that point in time because that may change. Um, I could give someone an advice today, but they're traveling next month, and by the time they get there, the vendor that I selected just doesn't work. So that's what we do. Thank you. Any other questions? <laughs> Resources for overcoming, or rather working with insecurity and sense of self. Is that a fair summary? Yep. Cool. It's um, a good question. I would say um, have good friends. I think that I don't, I, I, I don't consider myself someone who has a lot of close friends, but the ones that I do are my greatest supporters. Um, I also think that it is perfectly acceptable, and I don't do it a whole lot now, but I certainly did, to toot your own horn. Um, be proud of what you do. Be public about what you do. Be really good at what you do and make that known. That seems to be uh, not a very accepted 
thing. I think that if there are certainly contexts in which if I just stepped out and said, I am really, really fucking good at what I do, people would frown. I think that that was like a bad move, that that was somehow a negative statement. But I, I don't think that it should be. I think that if you start viewing yourself as good at what you do, and actually up to something and passionate about what you're doing and passionate about learning, I think slowly over time, how other people relate to you will change as well. But um, I'll, I'll put some more thought into um, re resources um, specifically, and I'll tweet them out if I think of any. Any other questions? Just shout them out, I can't always see, so. Uh, could you comment on the effect of end of Snowden? The effect of Snowden, in what context? Government surveillance, media, something else? All of the above. All of the above. Um, I actually don't really know the effect on sort of in terms of government so surveillance. I think that my, my sense is that something's changed. A lot of things remain the same. Um, I think in the context of newsrooms, um, editors, reporters, um, newsrooms as a whole um, see, see the need for digital security and they see the need for, for security staff that can work with them along the way and especially on projects like this. They don't sort of go at it alone. They sort of see that there is a need for that ex expertise and that has to come from outside of the newsroom. So I'm going to wrap it up here.